better prepared for the surgery because that's just my addition. That's great. So, uh, uh, as you said, uh, the, uh, my dear colleagues and the panel, uh, in acute stage, we don't touch the patient. Uh, we just try to pass this acute stage. We have to make strict non repairing I personally sometimes put total contact cast uh, <laughs> if I do it myself, uh, but I never allow uh, uh, any non-trained person to make total contact cast uh, for the patient. Uh, and I keep the patient, as Dr. Mukhtar said, we follow up each visit. Uh, usually the acute stage takes around two uh, months or eight to 12 months, usually until it subsides. Uh, and when we move to subacute stage, we can see what we are going to do. Unfortunately, this in, didn't happen to the patient. As uh, you see here, someone put for hair fixation. And as Dr. Nassif said, uh, every metal is uh, apart. And the patient had totally dislocated ankle, as you see here. And this was the fate of the uh, fracture. And uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, the patient was thought after doing the operation, she is going to be able to repair. She was not enough compliant after surgery. And of course, uh, the bone resorption continued and this metal failure uh, happened. And this is the examination of the patient. When she came to me after around uh, one year of unstable ankle in this way, and the patient was standing on it sometimes touching the ground with the medial malleolus and remnants of medial malleolus. So this is the time when she came to me. And this is, by the way, a standing X-ray EP view and standing lateral view. The patient stands on it with a very high risk of problem. So in this stage, with the patient standing, the ankle looks nice and uh, there is no erythema. Looks nice, I mean, the skin condition is not so bad. Uh, and the patient uh, now coming to you with uh, such a situation. Who is going to make conservative for this stage? And he is going to make tibio calcanean fusion. And he is going to make fixation by plate or Elizarov or pan Taylor fusion with nail and plate. So what's your choice? First, who, who anybody wants to do uh, a conservative management for this patient? no conservative management for this patient okay i see in the chat now no one okay uh, a lot of you uh, talk about pantaler fusion tibio calcanea fusion by nail elizarov okay of course a fusion tibio calcanea fusion is the corner store in this case by any means i prefer the last option doing pantaler fusion because in these cases the subtalar joint is usually uh, uh, also dislocated and damaged. I usually use tibio calcanean nail like that. I fix the calcanea cuboid with the same nail screw here, and I use a long plate. This is a multi-hole plate. I take it from the tibia until teronavicular. So I have a very rigid posterior or hind foot with the ankle like this way. Uh, to do that, you need an approach uh, which is combined approach. Someone will tell me, you are doing combined approach in the Sharko patient with insensible. Okay, I want to, the panel to answer. Uh, do you usually do that? And uh, is there a problem with the skin incisions you face usually? No, no. Uh, many times, uh, uh, regarding the fixation method, or nail alone, nail and plate, uh, external fixator. If there is a chronic ulcer draining pus, I do external fixator. Uh, many times I do very long lateral incision, sometimes combined with the medial incision, sometimes combined with a midfoot incision, a very dislocated navicular uh, or impending ulcer over a, a sorry, a, a dislocated cuneiform. And there is no, if the patient has good circulation, there is no problem with wound healing. Especially okay. Dr. Mohammed Muftar has emphasized in two important points. First of all, you have intact closed skin, number one. You have good, good perfusion of blood, so no uh, problem with that, even there is, if there is no sensation. My question to Dr. Khalif and Dr. Nasif, what if you have clean ulcer in one side, for example, clean ulcer on the lateral malleolus, and usually you face this, or clean ulcer on the medial malleolus? 
what are you going to do? Are you going to do the same auto reduction in tendon fixation or what? I would go for an open adapter because stability gives you a very good option for healing the ulcer because the ulcer is usually because of the uh, malposition of the foot and ankle which rubs against the orthotex or whatever. So if I provide the patient with a stable ankle or a stable foot, it usually uh, helps to stabilize the thing and I find very good outcome by healing of the ulcer after doing the uh, stabilization. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Nasif? Uh, same thing like Dr. Ahmed, of course, he said. Uh, I, I noticed you, you stressed on clean ulcer, and this is also yeah. a key. Uh, if the ulcer is different, if it's infected, if it's secondary infection, then probably an Ilizaro would be better. But like Dr. Yeah. Ahmed stressed, uh, uh, it, the ulcer is as a result of the malalignment. So if yeah. you correct the alignment, usually without any, people think you need the plastic surgeon or you need uh, some kind of coverage or treatment. Yeah. If you leave it alone, it heals tremendously and it feels very good without any other further. Uh, Dr. Bukhtar, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah. um, uh, if the ulcer, even if infected, but is over a bony prominence, and we remove the bony prominence, and there is no extensive infection beyond this bony prominence, very so good. I can do internal fixation. Yeah. But if yeah. the ulcer is big, and the infection is extending into the ankle and the tibia plafond, then I think in these cases that Ilizarov is there. Well, yes, this is very good. Yeah, so these are two important messages the panel have transferred to you. First of all, the skin is not a problem as long as you have good blood perfusion. Second of all, the ulcers is not a problem as long as it's a pressure ulcer from malalignment and it's clean and there is no actual infection. In this case, you can use internal fixation and don't worry of internal fixation. This kind of plate is a multi-hole plate, which I use, I love it, and it adds very nice stability. This is a follow-up of a patient post-operative. Of course, I put the patient for slab for the first two weeks until I remove the stitches, then I put the patient in a cast, as we said, from 10 to 12 weeks, and this is the follow-up of the patient after three months, and then I remove the cast, and the patient have this very nice alignment, as well as a very nice fusion. And here is the foot of the patient uh, before the surgery, and here is the foot of the patient after surgery, and you can see the patient. I phoned her yesterday to send me from her bedroom this video, and she was nice. She took this video and sent it to me. Of course, with the terrible situation she had and the photo on the left side, I think this is a good achievement for her. Now, the take home message, which we want you to know is this algorithm. And I owe to uh, Mr. Dr. Hisham, uh, is one of our uh, senior registrars in Inchamps University, and uh, Dr. Zahar and his colleague, because uh, this systematic review uh, study, which was discussed by Dr. Ahmed Khrouf, was very interesting for algorithm of management after uh, studying uh, 62 articles about management of uh, 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 fractures in diabetics and diabetes. First of all, for patient with ankle fracture, you have to ask yourself, is this patient is diabetic? And the answer, how can I know this patient is diabetic or not? If the patient has fasting blood sugar, uh, which is uh, uh, more than uh, 126, has random blood sugar more than 200, has uh, uh, glucose challenge test positive, elevated hemoglobin, in this case, the patient is diabetic. In this case, if the patient is not diabetic, uh, as simple management, as Dr. Nasif, Dr. Khalif, Dr. Ahmed, Ahmed Mukhtar said, but if he is diabetic, in this case, ask yourself the second question. Does this patient have peripheral vascular disease? And how can I answer these questions? How I can diagnose as orthopedic surgeon if he has peripheral vascular disease? If he has claudication pain, this is in favor of peripheral vascular disease. If he have signs of cool facial skin, dystrophic nails, if he has ankle brachial index less than 0.9, normally it's 1 to 1.3, or more than 1.3, which means there is a hyperperfusion uh, and failure of compressibility of the uh, articles, it's the same. In this case, the patient will develop uh, peripheral vascular disease. So if the patient has peripheral vascular disease, in this case, you have to consult vascular surgeon if it is repairable or not. If the patient has no vascular disease, and in this case, you have to move to the third question. 
The third question is the patient have peripheral neuropathy or not? How can we diagnose peripheral neuropathy? As we said, there is what we call Michigan Neuropathy Screening Index. In this case, the patient will have a two-point discrimination test is positive, vibration test is positive, Achilles reflex is diminished, he has may ulceration or neuropathic deformity as seen in x-rays or clinical. If the patient has no neuropathic in this case, the patient will have the standard management of fractures. But if he has neuropathy, in this case, you have to ask the fourth question. Is this patient is Charco or it's just diabetic, but he has fracture in diabetes? To differentiate, we told you about history examination x-ray. And in this case, if the patient is Charco, we will took total contact fast as acute phase. And if not Charco, uh, if the patient is not Charco, we will manage him uh, as the algorithm, we, which I will mention you right now. So this is the first, how to differentiate. This is the first to come message. You have to differentiate between fracture in diabetic and Charco by these questions when you have a patient with fracture ankle. The second question is, uh, the second uh, algorithm is, uh, if the patient has acute ankle fracture in diabetic, now he is not Charco, he's just acute ankle fracture. Look at the patient. If it is open, just make urgent serial irrigation and deprivement. If it is closed you and stable, undisplaced, unimalular fracture, this is what Dr. Zahir Hassan has said. If it is stable, closed, undisplaced, unimalular fracture, you can go for conservative, doing cast for this patient. But if it is unstable or displaced or bimalular fracture or trimalular fracture, with skin tinting and apparent dislocation, in this case, you have to make urgent closed reduction for the patient with well-molded splint until it is not dislocated. And in this case, you can go for standard management of acute fracture in diabetic. But if it is irreducible, in this case, you have to make urgent surgical reduction with transarticular pins or unipolar external fixator. Uh, if the patient is not dislocated and the skin condition is okay, we optimize this skin condition and we assess the peripheral vascular uh, condition. If there is no peripheral neuropathy, we make fixation, standard or fixation without any problem. But if he has peripheral neuropathy with good skin condition, we make rigid fixation as mentioned in the first case. If there is poor skin condition, in this case, we may wait by or using another alternative method like intramedullary nails or Elizarov or transarticular uh, fixation. If the patient has peripheral vascular disease, in this case, we make vascular reconstruction if it is possible. If it is not possible, we will go for, uh, due to medically unstable patient, we will make conservative treatment. If the patient is medically stable, we can make closed reduction with Elizarov and external fixation. I'm sorry, this algorithm is a little bit, uh, a lot of tree, a big tree, uh, but it covers all the options you may face in a patient with uh, fracture uh, and uh, with fracture in diabetes. Uh, so if you go through this, I think you will solve any problem. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope uh, the case was clear for you, and I wait for any questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Isamu, for this nice uh, illustration of, you know, like uh, patterns of fractures in diabetic patients. Um, and the fracture I had here in the questions and in, in the chat box, um, how do you differentiate between a clean ulcer and unclean ulcer? As you stated, and Dr. Uh, Mukhtar stated that if the ulcer is probably clean, then, you know, like I would probably be inclined more towards some form of internal fixation if it's unclear you will go for external fixation. So how do you differentiate? Of course, you look at the ulcer by clinical examination, if there is discharge, bad odor or bad smell, this is unclear ulcer. Of course, you have to be sure from a swab that the ulcer is clean. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes you have the patient negative swabs due to a prolonged use of antibiotics in this kind of patient. So if the ulcer looks with healthy granulation tissue on the bottom, and there is no discharge in the ulcer, no bad odor, and the swab is negative, I consider this clean ulcer. Also lab investigations are normal. The most important is white blood cell count. Don't rely too much on ESR and CRP unless it's very, very high. 
because in some in most of Charcot cases it's elevated. But yeah. uh, the most important is white blood cell count as well as the swabs and the clinical examination. So another question is when to consider amputation in a patient with Charcot? Uh, well, amputation with a patient with Charcot. Okay, uh, for me, I will go with amputation if there is a risk for the life of the patient. In yes. this case, I have to, uh, usually we try uh, to save the uh, region and then to save the limb and then to save the patient. If the limb is, uh, the patient has uh, marked anemia and uh, there is uh, chronic discharge of pus uh, elevated renal uh, 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 function test uh, is abnormal and the patient in shock stage and there is no clearance of infection of course the antibiotics may kill the patient and you are yeah. waiting for what in this case i do it uh, and usually this is in advanced cases neglected cases or mismanaged cases with uh, marked infection or uh, with gangrene in this case i do of course uh, amputation yeah. So another question from the panel, uh, from the audience is, do you find a place for VAC therapy? Uh, for example, if the patient has an ulcer and you, you know, like you're worried about it, do you find yeah, Of course. Yeah. VAC therapy is very effective for the patients. Uh, I can use VAC therapy uh, in even post-operative uh, stage after you uh, make uh, uh, your fusion and you still have an ulcer which you uncover and the plastic surgeons um, see, it's uh, not that deep ulcer, which will not affect uh, the outcome. In this case, I use back therapy, and it's very, very successful uh, for most of patients. Uh, I do for them. Uh, it's very successful. Of course, it depends on uh, cleanness of the ulcer and depth of the ulcer and width of the ulcer. Uh, yeah. But uh, if there is a small uh, ulcer, clean, post-operative, you can uh, use back therapy, and it's very effective. If not, you may need some deprivement and you may need coverage later on with the skin or flap, uh, graft or flap here. Uh, another question that we have here that uh, you show the case where you use two incisions. So do you use the, you know, like the seven centimeter rule between the skin incisions in diabetic patients or how do you judge? No, not only in diabetic patients, in any patient, the seven yeah. centimeter rule is essential. And there is another rule, you can do it. If you have uh, two incisions, you, the distance between two incisions should be should be more than half the length of the longer incision. So if you have one incision 10 centimeter and another incision 7 centimeter, the distance should be more than 5 centimeter. And this rule, I learned it from plastic surgeons, as they told me that this is easy for you. Look, what is the longest incision? It's 10 centimeter. And the other one is 7. So the distance should be at least 5. Yes. Okay. Got you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser Osama, for this very nice illustration of, uh, you know, like uh, fractures in diabetic patients. And uh, does any one of the panel has any other questions or comments about this? Uh, uh, nice, very nice cases. Uh, thank you very much. I just need to, I hope that we can uh, keep the this algorithm uh, on the uh, Facebook page or on this discussion. Uh, yes, probably you can put this on uh, the Facebook page or something. Yeah. And as well the papers by Dr. Nossif yeah. about yeah. the health of rotation. And sure. uh, thank you very much. I need to conclude now because I think we have been with us for a long time, more than two hours. Yeah. So thank you for being patient with us for this time, but it was really very interesting talk. So let's jump to the uh, take home message, uh, Dr. Head. Just a quick to a whole message that ankle fractures should not be taken as simple as uh, you might think. Uh, think more deeply about your ankle fracture. Don't hesitate to go for investigation, CT scan, or stress views if you feel that you need to go for it. Uh, so it's not that simple, ankle fracture, uh, intraarticular fracture, especially the ankle. The ankle is a small size joint carrying most of the body weight. So it is not very forgiving if you get some malreduction or mal rotation. It's not very forgiving other, other joints. Soft tissue injuries like syndesmose and ligament, always think about them, putting them in the back of your mind. Because if you don't think about them, you will not see them. And if you don't see them, you are in trouble. Careful assessment, x-ray, CT scan, use all the tools in your hand. 
so that you can get a very good diagnosis and get a good plan for your planning carefully. Spend some more time in planning for ankle fracture. Use the diagnostic tools, take your time for planning so that by doing this, you save the patients a lot of hazard, a lot of time, and save yourself a lot of trouble as well. Diabetic patients think about the Charcot arthropathy, and I think Professor Osama gave us a very nice talk, take home message with this uh, very nice algorithm. I hope that it's going to be beneficial for you. Uh, at the end of the, this uh, case presentation, I would like to thank you very much for your attendance and for your participation. A uh, special thanks to our distinguished faculty, uh, Professor Nasr Muhammad Nasif, Professor Osama Shazdi, Professor Muhammad Mukhtar, Professor uh, Dr. Ahmad uh, Akhid. Of course, thank you very much for the CDC who hosted this uh, CDC of the Egyptian chapter, uh, Professor Zahar Hassan and Professor Sharif Khalid with them, Professor Ahmad Khid. Thank you for having you with us, Professor Hazm Abdul Azim. Until this time, your opinion. Thank you very much for participating with us and giving us, as usual, your precious opinions. Uh, thank you very much, all for you, for your participation. And we hope to see you soon in uh, future events. Thank you very much. Have, stay safe, stay happy, and good night to all of you. Thank you. Bye. Awesome.